And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, a man who ends up who plays way too much theory crafting with Age of Empires and is possibly the big the biggest Persia apologist in that game. <laughs> and currently developing the tableless role playing game Enclave. The one and only Robbie Howell. How you well, doing today, man? I'm doing great. A, a delightful introduction. I couldn't have asked for a better one. Mm -hmm. I had I had to get that jab in about per, about Persia. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> oh. it, I mean, in, in my defense, that'd be like asking a a civil somebody who's made a bunch of civilization content. Okay, how how many times did you did you tell Montezuma to fuck off? Yeah, pretty much. Because <laughs> he's a dick. Oh yeah. But. A tradition around here is opening with the humble beginnings of a sort. So, walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. Oh, gladly. Yeah, so for me, I, I have a kind of unusual uh, tragic backstory with, uh, with tabletop in general. Uh, for me, um, it started when I was seven, and I saw all these awesome video games at friends' houses that my parents would not let me play. Uh, we, we were allowed to play Age of Empires, but that was about it. And there were so many other awesome ones out there that I just ended up saying to myself, I'm desperate to play these things. Why don't I just, like, act them out, right? And so me and eventually a couple friends started trying to, like, act out video games. Um, and this started escalating quite quickly to the point where I started trying to make my own versions of these, like, acting out games. Um, they got more sophisticated to the point where when I was 12, I was I had a game that had, like, 20-ish players. Then when I was 14, I made a new game that got like 30. That one was, for, for me at the time, that was huge, right? Um, and it's at that point that I started to try to, I guess I took it a little more seriously. Um, I didn't know about d and My first exposure to that game was when I was about 17 years old. Um, and by that time, I had like gotten very entrenched in my own uh, particular diceless style of tabletop design. I, I can only like kind of put it in those words now. Because I, over the past couple of years, I've like really tried to immerse myself in the tabletop space so I actually know what's out there instead of just like literally coming to the same ideas through convergent evolution through trying to play video games with my voice. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, for me, for Enclave, uh, the game that I'm, I'm min-maxing right now uh, and that is currently out on Kickstarter, I came to that game because I loved Diablo 2 and I really wanted to make a Diablo game. Um, it looks nothing like Diablo now, but that's where it came from. And, and I came to, even though I ended up coming to kind of the same squad structure, you have classes, you have that sort of thing, like very D&D-esque. Um, my first drafts of Enclave were before I knew D&D was a thing. But since Diablo is in turn inspired directly by D&D, I was still kind of inspired by D&D, just like two steps removed, you know what I mean? You are technically correct. The best kind of correct. Yeah, so that's that's my tragic backstory. I was about to I was about to ask: Are we talking Greek or Shakespearean tragedy? I don't know which tragedy it would be. I think that what type of tragedy it is will depend on how well the Kickstarter does. <laughs> oh, at the at the very least, you won't you won't be a mighty number no. nine kind of tragedy. That's what I'm hoping at the very least. Mm -hmm. So, and I I do I do find it funny that. You reference Diablo. T you reference Diablo two because a lot because a lot of the a lot of the art and a lot of the visual aesthetic that I saw that I see with this um, is leans leans far more into a into a Tolkien inspired epic, and I I know Tolkien is used as the template for quote unquote generic fantasy, but it the reason I bring that up has more to do with the with the color palette, both in the design of the pages, and the and the way think the way things are written. Um, yeah, which does make does make me ask, and I I realize this is going to be a left field question. Did you, 
did you ever spend any time with the SCA? The SCA. I don't know it by that name. Um, the Society for Creative Anachronism. They... Okay, yes. I know a bit about them. I have followed some tangentially related stuff on YouTube. Mm -hmm. That's because the, there is... Even though even though it is all over the place, it's ju just the... There is a very consistent um, visual, visual aesthetic throughout that, throughout that I had seen. Because... I think it's fair. I think it's fair of me to say that regard that um regardless, Enclave is going to be leaning into fantasy more than anything else. Yeah, uh, the way I've I've set up Enclave is that it has an extremely flexible setting. Um, is the the game takes place within a self contained multiverse, and player characters are are agents in the employ of this omnipresent. Uh, incredibly subtle mercenary organization called the Enclave, which deploys them on missions all through this self-contained multiverse. So every single like game session can be in a completely different setting with a completely different tech level and all this. But I did make the conscious decision to, for this like most introductory version of the game, kind of lean more into classic medieval fantasy elements because those tend to be most accessible, first of all, and also because the artist that I'm working with, the incredibly talented Greg Taylor, that's like his MO. It's, it's his comfort zone, and I was like, you know, man, you're, you're doing me a huge favor by helping me with this project. I want to make it as comfortable for you as possible. And yet, and yet one of your classes is a gunslinger. Yeah. <laughs> I, I had Which... to throw in a couple of anachronisms. Does it does make given that it does make me wonder if within your ap appendix N, if the Dark Tower is in there? Yes, uh, the Dark Tower is one of the major influences for that class. For all of the classes I have in Enclave, I try to include what I call grounding, like saying here is the the real world or fiction or fantasy or mythology inspiration I took when creating this class, I try to make it such that every element of a class can be directly attributed to some element of how that class exists in existing fantasy, real world, etc. as like an archetype, you know what I mean? Um, like, not, not to the degree where every single iteration of that character is going to have all of what you see on the class, but to the point where you can kind of like trace it back, you know what I mean? I, I think it adds a lot more flavor. Um, and to that end, I, I even list out on each class like some examples of of current like characters that you might know from history and media that are would be good representations of that class. Mm -hmm. That's something that I think a lot more people um, should should do because there are there are plenty of there are plenty of classes and archetype designs that are very clearly ins inspired by a particular um, aesthetic. Like say it's it is impossible to separate the bar the barbarian aesthetic from well conan absolutely um it's difficult to it's it's difficult to separate the the um bar the i'd say i'd say the ra the ranger aesthetic from a from aragorn yep for sure um and there there's there's plenty there's plenty of other examples of characters that were so, were a big a big piece of pop culture and um that and some of the people inspired by it would become game designers. <laughs> totally. <laughs> I'd imagine a higher percentage than average even. Um I'm not I'm not going to say I know the amount but I but I would suspect it's more than people think it is. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I find that kind of tapping into grounding is is a great way of taking kind of wacky ideas and making them feel more approachable. Like mm -hmm. um, for the gunslinger, since you bring it up, um, one of the gunslinger's abilities that I have uh, is an ability called standoff. And typically when you think of a gunslinger in a game, they're going to be all about DPS, right? But in my experience looking at gunslinger media, gunslingers are almost as, not as much of course, but almost as much about their words as their guns being able to like stare someone down and like put out a quippy one-liner or something. You can win a fight like that well before you have to fire a shot. And, and so because of that, the gunslinger has a, a completely non-combat ability in standoff that I'd like to think still fits really well with the class's overall approach and it's, it's archetypal grounding. Yeah, when it, comes to, when it comes to gunslingers that would be all DPS, um... 
that's not the gunslinger that I usually think of. The one who I think would would better fit that bill is some is something out of a John Woo movie. Yeah, absolutely. And and in an enclave context, that would be a completely different class. Um, for if it's all right to give a little context here, um, mm -hmm. enclave is much older than than what I'm showing here. The the version I have out on Kickstarter is like I said, kind of a an, an intro version where. I can, I can get people accustomed to the system and kind of the way I approach things um, and try to keep it on the cheaper side. Uh, but if this Kickstarter campaign does well, I have many, many more plans. Uh, I've been developing this game for almost nine years. Um, I, have a, I had a, a legacy playgroup um, that had about 50 active members at one time. Mm -hmm. um, and the game was tri tried by many more people than that. Uh, and in that legacy version, we had over 120 classes each with completely unique abilities and skill sets. And I'm, uh, my hope is to build this published version of Enclave slowly over time back to that height. Which cer certainly makes sense. And I'm, ge I'm guessing that you're going to be... Ta in if that kind of thing goes down, you'd take steps to make sure that it doesn't become um, a, a, spr a, sprawling, a sprawling bit of insanity. Well, my, my way of approaching that, because see, I love insanity, right? If, if you've taken a look at my Age of Empires stuff, you'd know that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but my, my, my compromise that I'm trying to go for is I want to split this gigantic, sprawling legacy game of mine into four different rule sets is my current plan. This intro one, and then second, third, fourth, and each one adds a bunch of new stuff without repeating anything from the older ones such that people can always buy into the game to whatever level of complexity they want without feeling like they're wasting pages or wasting money on just getting the same book again in a different form. Um, and at each level of complexity, I want to have not only new classes available, um, but I'd also love to put out just class bundles by themselves, just like a group of, of new classes that you can, you can buy into if you think there's one or two that you think look really cool. And... Uh, and eventually, like I said, build up to this this massive game that you don't have to go, you don't have to take the whole bite if you're not ready for it. Just take a little nibble at a time and, until you decide you like it, and then you can go in deeper. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the things that de that definitely that definitely stood out to me is the fact that you are technically speaking a diceless game. Oh, very diceless. And even nowadays, with the large, large variety in role-playing games that's available to us, diceless games are still a rarity. Yeah, I've and, noticed that more and more as I've tried to learn about them. I mean, there, there's been, there's, there's obviously some, there's obviously standouts. Amber is the is the one diceless game that everybody's going to bring up in one form or another. Oh yeah. Um, I'd say the closest game that I've found to Enclave is Amber. Yeah, that's the one everybody brings up. There was also Marvel Universe, which is kind of the redheaded stepchild of the Marvel TTRPGs. <laughs> um, in part because it was made right around the time of the Marvel bankruptcy story, and in part because I think I think trying to do diceless with superheroes was a bad was a bad combination, especially since they. Marvel. It was. It was not one where Marvel contracted a game development studio or or the no, like it. to <laughs> do it. No, they decided. No, Toy Biz decided to do it themselves That's and rough. thought that thought that they could compete with the recently released D and D third edition, which yeah, is. Jesus. Um. You ever? You know the saying: "You can't eat anything bigger than your head." <laughs> I haven't, but now I have, and I think I know where you're going with this. <laughs> well, they they tried. Everybody Certainly. brings everybody use the analogy of of Icarus flying too close to the sun, or eyes bigger than your stomach. I prefer to go with a more visceral example of a mad, of putting the mental image of someone trying to eat something that's larger than their own head. Uh huh. Ed, Ed and Eddie with a jawbreaker. That's rough. Mm -hmm. I I will say I think superheroes can work in diceless, though. Um, Marvel superheroes, that's kind of tough because they're, they're kind of designed to completely bust like conceptions of reality, which makes it kind of hard to root the game in the common sense that you normally need to base diceless designs in. 
the I ended up co I covered the Mar the Marvel Universe RPG a few years ago. I had said I had said that the the big the big problem was that everything revolved around um re revolved around red and white red and white um chits Bas basically exp basically expending tokens which is the which on paper that's that's not too much of an issue in practice the big the big problem was that you only have two resource pools yeah. and you're having everything boil down to these two resource pools yeah and to me that that means that the game wasn't entirely diceless like obviously it doesn't have literal dice but you're still using a like a tangible resolution metric of some kind you're you're um, not using a randomized um resource which is why I, which is why i consider it diceless I see. Yeah, yeah, that's a very fair distinction. Yeah, I, I'd say in that respect, Enclave takes it a good deal further than that. Um, I think Amber also doesn't have a like a, a tangible expendable resource. I think instead Amber really loves its tables, where you're like kind of comparing your scores and things against um, against other like barriers in game. Pretty, Don't quote me on that, <laughs> but it's that's it, the impression I got. It's not far. It's not far off. And in all fairness. For whatever reason, everybody in the '90s had this massive boner for tables. I've noticed. <laughs> it's it. It was to it was to the point where I, w I was read I was reading I was reading one I was reading one project and I en I ended up I ended up having the visualization of of Metallica singing "I Am the Table," <laughs> <laughs> which I I partially blame on on. On watching Botchamania way too much because that was a because that was used as a running gag whenever a table spot would happen and the table didn't break, mm. um, also known as a Japanese table. <laughs> <laughs> you know, someone gets sla someone gets slammed into a table and the table's supposed to break in half, yeah, and, it th and then it doesn't, so and it just looks like shit. Oh jeez! <laughs> but the that's. In in that review, I had I had said this was this was a decent idea. It was just it was just in the wrong game, and sure, it sounds like it. Even some even something like I've covered um I've I've also cov I've also covered other diceless games like Xenoscape, which use utilizes resources, but utilizes it utilizes it to reinforce the game's themes. That being a um post post apocalypse where where um a lot of Nature has re has reclaimed the world, and the wor the world outside of villages is very very hostile to you, as anybody know knows if they've ever been deep in a forest. Yeah. Um. But it's definitely it's definitely a bold it's definitely a bold move to do diceless. And um, was was it was it, in your case was it a product of the of the whole acting out thing, or was there a different reason why you went with diceless? for your project yeah 100 percent the the background for me like i i didn't even conceptualize when i was trying to imitate video games going, growing up that you could use things like dice um and by the time that i really kind of learned that that was an option it kind of felt like it kind of felt like it wasn't the point anymore you know what i mean um and so over the years of making diceless games i've just found a lot of different ways of resolving things in game in a way that's very satisfying um and and kind of i can say now now that i've seen what else is out there it, in my experience it really helps elevate player agency and skill expression uh, which to me are extremely important um i think that when the one key difference with diceless is it's it does require a, a different mentality going into it like mm -hmm. when you're going into something diceless uh you need to understand that even more than a normal tabletop game, and normal tabletop games have plenty of this, um, a lot of what is happening is going to come down to a human element. Um, but I think that that's the point. Um, I think that that's one of the things that makes tabletop games really strong and special and different, um, is that there is this, this core human element that is driving the plot and, and making the narrative happen. And one of the key ways that you drive the plot and make narrative happen is through making calls. And, and sometimes your calls are are gonna not do what the dice would do, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, one of the mantras I have in the temple is the dice gods show no mercy. Yes. But humans do. And I think that's huge. Mm-hmm. 
now taking taking that taking that into account um even i did no i did notice that you ha you obviously have the tw the 12 stat setup but f if i'm if i'm understanding this pro this properly when it comes to when it, when it comes to characters you have the you have the st you have the stats ab abilities and gear are are the are the str the strongest um, factors when it comes to what a character can and cannot do. Those are your key levers, to use a term that a lot of my old players used to talk about. Mm -hmm. They are the buttons that you can press. Yeah, but there there's a couple other tools that kind of go beyond those. Like I don't know if you got to energy work in the book, but that's a big freaking part of it. And even though it's a, an optional mechanic, it's still uh, I've had a number of people describe that as the the single most important mechanic in the game, and that has nothing to do with uh, stats, abilities, or or gear. I don't. Th I think I. I think I may have seen that, but it. But it did bring the question of of the fact that you have a you have um health and essence, but it isn't. But it isn't exactly listed on the sheet. Yeah, stamina rather. Mm -hmm. Um. So the way the way that we the way we handle resources in Enclave is kind of a combination of holistic what makes sense um, and also a little bit of quantification to the point where it becomes a little more accessible for people who aren't used to, for example, like literally being so tired that your body is like breaking down. You know what I mean? Like not everyone has had that experience. Not everyone has had the experience of getting you know a, a horrific, gruesome injury, mm. um, and because of that, it's one of the useful things about making it a game is that you can kind of gamify those elements to just enough of a degree that they become easier to conceive for people. Um, so the way we do stamina and essence, stamina being your physical energy and essence being your magical energy, is we break them down into thresholds. And we say, are you in the green? Are you in the yellow? Are you in the red? And this is not something that you have to track painstakingly on your sheet. It's, it's quite intuitive. Um, if you are like in the middle of a, in the middle of a mission, and you've just experienced a tight combat scene, and you just say, "Hey, uh, what's my stamina like?" And your and your conduit can say, "Oh, you know, I, I say you're about mid yellow right now." Um, because it like because you have that sort of ability to just kind of like check in, um, you don't need to have it as strictly noted down on your sheet. I think that some people will do it, especially if they're in a circumstance or playing a character who really cares about those things. Um, but for the most part, it just kind of allows them to be narrative tools where not only are they going to inhibit you and limit you from doing certain things as you get lower but they also provide acting opportunities uh which in enclave is a uh, something that i really really try to promote mm -hmm. and in the same vein in the same vein as that you have a cool down approach with some of the um abilities for for various classes Absolutely. So I'm cu I'm curious how, I'm curious how you have that I have that quantified in the same de in the same degree. Yeah. So the way that we came to cooldown was as such, right? Um, if you just use essence as the limiter for how often you can use your magic, it means that spirit, the stat that scales your essence, becomes without question the best stat in the game, um, and it means that people just min max that stat. Uh, because using abilities is very good. Um, I don't know if you got this impression while reading, but the way that I try to design Enclave is that abilities are quite powerful, like very, very impactful. Because mm -hmm. um, it helps it helps make it clear what they are doing in the moment. Because again, we're diceless, you know what I mean? Like It's hard to give like tiny incremental advantages um, and make them feel relevant. Um, so because of that, abilities are strong. If you have access to these strong things and you can use them constantly, uh, only limited by your essence, it means that whatever gives you essence is amazing. Um, to that end, we tried to use two different ways of limiting uh, your ability uses. Uh, one is your essence. That has a more kind of narrative element to it of as your essence gets lower, your character will start to hallucinate and do all, like, it, it just brings, like, their mood gets all, all fried. Uh, it, it's just like a really cool acting opportunity that adds a lot of drama and also makes sense to, uh, to scale with a stat. Mm -hmm. um, the cooldown, on the other hand, that's more of a, a fixed, how do I describe it, like a safety valve, right? Where if a player, this is, this is not a common occurrence, I should note, but if a player is like kind of getting a little ahead of things and is like throwing stuff out, the conduit can just be like, hold up, cooldown, right? 
especially if you have a very, very powerful ability, like uh, on the Gunslinger, that ability standoff, if you could use that thing anytime you wanted, that would be disgusting. Uh, and so the cooldown kind of helps you say, as a conduit, all right, I'm going to kind of pace out my mission um, such that my players have opportunities to use their cool toys, but have to use them at least somewhat sparingly so that they don't invalidate every challenge I throw at them with the same set of tools. Does that kind of make sense? Yeah. And speaking of that, with the classes, there is, there is the chart de de describing um, their rating when it comes to combat, social, and utility. Yeah. Uh, now, obviously, obviously, that's not a stat. So I'm guessing that's that's more to that's more to be a demonstration onto where that class is going to lean into what it what it's going to be better at. Yeah, that's like a subjective play style gauge. I had one in, during my, my blind play testing I did uh, like half a year, a year ago. I had one play tester say, hey, uh, do, you, do you think you could put something in like in League of Legends so I know if I want to play like a combat character, I can just flip to the combat page like and not have to think about the others? And I was like, yeah, that shouldn't be too hard. And so I tried to put in a, like a little, little graph. I, I think that... Um, as I as I hopefully expand the game, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna change the way I approach that and maybe add a little more nuance to it. But for now, I, I think it does a pretty good job of letting people like settle on what classes they want to play quickly and easily without getting hung up on reading through all six of them. Mm -hmm. Now, with that with that in mind, I'd let I I'd kind of like to go th go through the classes that you had presented in the in the document you had sent me, of course, and ju and just get just get a vibe for what for what their kit is going to be like. We'll skip Gunslinger because we well covered that already. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next one would be Illusionist. Yeah, the Illusionist I would say is arguably the hardest class um, in this in this set of six. Uh, it is a mage, but it is a incredibly low damage class. It is a utility class first and foremost. Mm -hmm. um, that you could think of it almost as the premier stealth class out of these six, because uh, all of its abilities have to do with controlling attention um, and disguising or or masking your movements, your actions, your appearance, etc., or those of those around you. Um, it's one of those classes where. When you first look at it, you're like, oh, this seems pretty straightforward. And then you start to unlock a whole ton of different, like, crazy things you can do with it. Uh, and its gear gives it a, a little bit of extra utility that isn't just based in its kind of core illusory kit, um, so that it, it isn't just trapped in that one single gimmick, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Librarian. All right. Uh, this one, I would say, is the fan favorite based on my blind playtesting. Um, it has more ability than I think it and the and the Wanderer, which we'll get to later, have the most ability to directly interface with the story through Enclave's collaborative storytelling mechanics. Uh, the Librarian is a information gathering and kind of team coordinating class. It probably has the single worst combat ability out of all six of them. Um, but much like the Illusionist, it has great utility, but its utility is in a completely different direction, all about uncovering information um, and kind of making use of that information and empowering their team with that information. I, I, just to, to give an example of what Enclave is like, one of the librarian's core abilities is called Fun Fact. Mm -hmm. uh, with Fun Fact, you pitch, namely you suggest a detail of, the, of the, the plot, the surroundings, your mission, and your conduit can say, I like that, I'm going to use it, I, don't, I can't make use of that, I'm sorry, or often somewhere in the middle. Um, but fun fact allows you to pitch a piece of information that you frame as like, oh, did you know blank? Uh, and if your conduit accepts it, that piece of information is taken as true and ha as having been true the whole time. And that gives the librarian an enormous amount of ability to kind of sculpt the plot um, in a way that is, is copacetic with their conduit's vision, of course. But when you get good at this class, you just gain an enormous potential to, to, to solve missions. Mm-hmm. Thane. So the Thane, I would say, is the most balanced class in the game uh, in terms of combat, social, and utility, which are the three kind of metrics I grade classes by. Um, they are kind of a, a classic tank archetype. If you like kind of fighty tanks, you're going to love the Thane. 
But the, the, the Thane also kind of puts a spin on it by also having a lot of great social potential through rallying largely NPCs, but also they can like work with, with their team. They, they're a very teamwork-oriented class. Um, one of their core abilities uh, lets them literally arm their allies with weapons they conjure from nowhere, and those weapons only vanish if, their ally, uh, if that ally disobeys or betrays them in some way. So it's a, an incredibly team-oriented kind of strategic class that does rely on a cooperative group of people. And if their allies, like their, their fellow Enclave warriors, aren't, are, aren't cooperative, they can easily work with NPCs. Yeah. Um, Thunderbird. Um, I've had people say this is the most fun class. Uh, it's a very dynamic movement-based mage. Uh, very high damage, kind of the opposite of the illusionist. Uh, and some utility in terms of things like shaping the weather. Uh, one of the things the Thunderbird does really well is its mobility is spectacular. Uh, it can fly all over the place. It can hop into the air and then shoot back down for huge damage. Uh, really fun, really dynamic, but it requires a lot of like setup to make it work properly. So you need to be good at timing when you're, when you're fighting with a Thunderbird. Uh, and also it has a higher chance for collateral damage than probably any other class that is out of this list. So... High risk, high reward, very dynamic, very fun. Yeah. Um, Wanderer. And lastly, the Wanderer. Uh, I would say that the Wanderer is the poster child of Enclave, at least out of this set. Uh, they, again, like the Librarian, do a lot with pitching. Uh, but the Wanderer's pitching feels very different. They're not just trying to get information. The Wanderer instead is kind of a broad brush utility support class that has a very strong social game and has this tendency of kind of getting stuck in the story of the mission. They kind of insert themselves where they don't belong and, and make, make do from there. Um, good at coordinating with their team to some degree, but also very good at just going off on their own. Uh, to give you an example of I, what I would say their most iconic ability is, they have an ability called Familiar Face. Uh, like Fun Fact, it's a pitch ability, but with Familiar Face, you can pitch a pre-existing relationship between yourself and an NPC on mission um, and if accepted, that has been true the whole time. Um, obviously, this can be disgustingly powerful, uh, and as such, there's a number of safeguards in place for this ability, such that its likelihood to succeed is directly proportionate to how beneficial that relationship would be and how kind of compelling of a case you make for yourself. In this case, saying like, oh yeah, I'm the king's best friend, that's not going to fly. If you want to say, uh, the king hates my guts, that's, that's more acceptable, because at least you're not giving yourself a positive interaction with a powerful figure. But saying you're best friends with a servant or something, that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. um, and maybe, maybe it's just my own interpretation, but what I saw out of, out of the Wanderer is what the Bard is supposed to be. Yeah, I've had people say it, and I, when I was trying to figure out which of my you know 120-plus classes to put in this edition... The Wanderer really jumped out as something that I, I felt would help represent what Enclave is while being somewhat familiar and also kind of signaling the direction that it's trying to go in as, as it differs from the, the current TTRPG landscape. That would certainly make sense. Because the intent, the intent of the Bard has, al has always been to be akin to a, sc a Scald or a Celtic Priest. Yeah. But a lot of people have gotten hung up on the musical instrument part yeah. instead of the yeah. storyteller part, which is what bards are supposed to be. Absolutely. Uh, having researched them quite a lot, particularly the, the Celtic uh, Shanaki, um, I always felt like that element of the grounding is incredibly cool. I, I have Enclave classes based in that very grounding myself. Um, but from what I've seen, the, the bard... I feel like people who enjoy bards in D&D are going to gravitate, not only gravitate to the Wanderer and Enclave, but will probably gravitate a lot to Enclave in general, just mm -hmm. at a guess. Whereas, I know, you, I know you made the tank analogy with the Thane, but I, I, view, the, I view the Thane far, far more akin to the, war, the Warlord or the, or, um, the, or the Marshal, depending on, depending on edition. I know, I know for some people it's blasphemous for me to bring up the addition everybody tells me I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because they don't pay me. <laughs> <laughs> but 
the Warlord scratched an itch that people didn't know that they had, and ever since, people have tried to bring that over into more recent editions. Yeah, I, I don't know what the class is, but I can kind of guess, like, coordination plus, like, frontline combat sort of thing. The, the Warlord is a frontline commander. Yeah. The, the, they're, they're, the per, they're the person who, they're, they're not a general, but they are a, they are a captain. They're not going to be a general of an army, but they are going to be a captain of a squad or a or the or the leader of a group of mercenaries. That kind of scale thing. Absolutely. Um, a soldier is going to hit you with his sword. The a warlord is going to hit you with his soldier. Yeah, that's that's very Thane. Uh, the Thane, I think, brings in the additional elements of like wanting to take hits themselves. They are they are very tanky, uh, as well as like I don't know if the warlord has is more like of a a tough approach to that or whether oh, they... they have more human elements but the the thane definitely gravitates more towards like the inspiring speech side of things it they can they certainly can it's it's one it's one angle but they are me they are meant to be able to take to be able to take a beating yeah they're not going to be able to take a beating as as much as say a, as much as say a dedicated fighter but they're not going to um drop in a couple in a couple hits this totally. is yeah, this it sounds very similar. This isn't Rangers in in um AD and D. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> who were at, who were situational at best and and otherwise useless to the point where it's theorized that they're the reason why the why the um why the Death's Door rules started to get implemented in later games because I Ranger don't know what that is. Um. You know how you know how in some games you run out of HP, you're di you're dying, but you have a chance to stabilize. Oh yeah, like Darkest Dungeon. Yeah, I, I Darkest, love Darkest Dungeon. Darkest Dungeon is one is one case. There's a but there's a bunch of other cases of it. The problem what the problem was, um, Rangers were were combat were combat focused, but they couldn't wield heavy armor, and because yeah. of the way Thaco worked back in the day, it meant that they were very squishy. So yeah. Ranger Down became kind of a running joke. No, oh dear. <laughs> we have a in in my legacy game. We have a couple of classes that are are literally trying to get hurt. Um, what we've kind of developed similar running gags to that I, I really hope to bring into the game uh, as it develops. My favorite being the Lamb, uh, which is a class that the central gimmick is generally around like taking damage and redirecting it. Um, and so in, in that case, we would there would be jokes of like, oh, what's the lamb doing this time? Jumping into a pit of spikes or something. Like you do you can get up all, to all sorts of nonsense with that one. But it was it was it was intentional, which is the key difference here. Mm-hmm. Oh. Oh, when you when you describe it as somebody trying to get hurt, all all I can think of is the um slayers in Warhammer Fantasy. <laughs> yeah. You know, they... Like like that but purely non combat. Mm-hmm. Because I'm, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with the, if you're familiar with Warhammer Fantasy, you're probably familiar with the Dwarven Slayers. Oh, certainly am. I, I loved the Warhammer Fantasy universe when I was uh, in like middle school, and I got really into the tabletop like fantasy battles game. Mm -hmm. uh, although ju just re just remember that Cetra is a better ruler than you. <laughs> we love Cetra. Cetra is a hero in this household, and I will not go a word against him. <laughs> uh, just don't make me read all of his titles. We don't have that kind of time. <laughs> but I, there, I, I will, I will admit playing playing as him in um, in in say total in say total Warhammer. Um, it is an absolute joy to see him um, out air against the the elves. Oh yeah, feel good. Or. Or or just to be completely nonplussed about how about the dark elves being dark elves even 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 saying impress me with your cruelty. Mm. <laughs> oh. And but the thing. And of course, of course, of course, in one ca in one case with the lizard men, be um them saying, I see, them calling him an envoy of the great necromancer, which. <laughs> it, I could easily I could easily envision that as as him using all of his strength and all of his will to not to not bitch slap him. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. It that is a lore slap right there. Oh. Uh, yeah, the Warhammer universe was a 
really big inspiration for me for mm -hmm. one of my my earlier games um like looking at it now, obviously there's a lot of kind of silly reductive parts to it, but it's still it's still good fun. I will say when it comes to that, um, fantasy is far more interesting to me than 40k is. Totally agree. I've had many arguments about this. <laughs> and yes, no. I know that there's just a country called Araby that's from where the frickin' Saudi... Like, yeah, I get it. It's dumb. I don't care. It's fun. <laughs> If you're gonna if you're gonna throw stones at that, then you have to throw just as many stones at Bretonia or the fact that yeah, the exactly. Empire of Man is the Holy just Roman the Empire. Holy Roman Empire, <laughs> yeah. It's there's there's so many very 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 silly parts of the game. Um, and it's campy, but that's I, I like camp, you know. Well, a lot of a lot of its a lot of its early days, especially if you look in the early days of White Dwarf magazine, is very Gilliam esque kind of humor. Yeah, which is I think is a really good complement to the setting. Like it, it does it. I think I don't know how much it does now, but it it used to always take itself like fair. Like it was pretty self aware, and it didn't take itself too seriously. I think it would have gotten really insufferable if it did. Well, the, that's that's why that's why I have that fondness for it because the a lot a lot of a lot of the. F with the 40k, there's the there's the focus on there's been this focus on dra on drama, but because but because everything because they bill itself on the grim darkness part, um, yeah. there isn't as much unless you're the orcs, there isn't as much opportunity to be fun. Whereas you definitely have the orcs who feel like what would happen if you if you got a bunch of football hooligans from especially especially nor especially um northern U northern UK's like like um. Are you familiar with the term Jordy? Of course I am. Yeah, a, bun a bunch of jo a bunch of Jordies and a bunch of Ma a bunch of Manchester rejects and made a fantasy race off of them. <laughs> the you have the Skaven who the bi the biggest threat to a Skaven is another Skaven. Mhm. Mm uh, you know, they could they could be the most powerful faction in the setting if they weren't getting in their own damn way. Oh yeah, and, and I think that that's sort of like it's almost like a, a storytelling heuristic that they're using to just like this is what you need to know, don't think about it too hard let's jump into the game. And mm -hmm. I, I think there's there's a place for that for sure. Yeah, especially since some settings go way 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 too much into into the most minute of de into the most minute of detail and the problem, that, the problem when you do that is it gets significantly harder to bring to bring people into it when you don't have the pitch. Yeah, absolutely. Oh. Um, I, I've definitely struggled with that problem myself on many occasions. Like, if you've ever gone down the rabbit hole of like world building uh, videos on YouTube, there's so many amazing ones. For to be clear, I love many of the creators in that space. But man, when you are sitting down trying to figure out the title patterns of your like homebrew world. And how it looked like twenty thousand, like twenty million years ago, you just start to like realize, what am I doing? Why can't I just wing it? <laughs> especially, especially since the person picking up isn't go shouldn't be expected to have encyclopedic knowledge. That's that's part of the that's part of the reason why I f why I um I even though I love the even though I love the Lord of the Rings universe, a lot of the stuff that I want to do want to do in Middle Earth. Is pro would probably piss off the purists because I'm not quite interested in maintaining canon. I'm I'm more interested in what if stories. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, and the same the same thing applies with with uh, with uh, with other settings. I did I did a whole BattleTech campaign based on what it what if um what if the what if the assassination of the Camerons was successful, but the, but the man who did it didn't didn't survive the encounter because he got wiped out by the Black Watch. Now that to me that does a great job of like leaving the world at, like the canonical world as is. Like I I don't like when people try to to change existing fantasy canon for a property I love obviously. But I love when people like try to take their own spin on something, um, and and in many ways just kind of bring it into an entirely new an entirely new IP, an entirely new world. Um, it, it was as someone who has been a kind of a compulsive world builder for a big chunk of his life, um, that was part of the reason that I, I kind of designed Enclave with a 
like this this mission to mission structure where the game is largely played in one shots and because of that you don't have to linger on a world for too long and if your players dig it they can choose to go back to that world later and and giving the players that that piece of choice removes a lot of onus from you to make something perfect the first time if if your players aren't digging it that's fine you never have to go back there again if they like it they can ask you for it and you could go back there as much as you want and when when you say when you say one off like that the um an, ap an approach i've of, i've often told players to consider is to not look at not look at your campaign as a as this grand sweeping epic that's going to take multiple books and sev and several years to finish wait am i ta am i talking about a, am i talking about a tabletop campaign or am i talking about game of thrones <laughs> <laughs> sorry i had to i had to get that jab in there but i say look at it less like that and more like an episode of a television show. Absolutely. Especially especially more. one that is serialized. Or a good one, even better. Because <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I will freely admit that I, gr I grew up with, even though it got cringe at, or af in a few, after a few years, um, early 2000s was, was a time where I was watching a lot of Law & Order. Mm -hmm. And the some of the structures within it did play a factor in in how I was approaching um, certain campaigns. Obviously, obviously, with certain with certain campaigns and certain games, this is easier to do than others. Yeah, I mean, with with something like Enclave, because it can because it can be in any particular dimen any particular dimension. The sky is the literal limit, mm -hmm. but. The but the setup can but if someone were to ask me to set up based on what I've seen I I just say, do you remember sliders, or quantum leap? Yeah, use steal from that and just and just go nuts. Yep, and that's a, a fantastic starting point. I I don't think there's a single thing wrong with that. Uh, obviously, um, obviously sli sliders is the main one I'm go I'm going with. I. I only saw bits of the original Quantum Leap. I didn't, and I didn't see the re the redone that was done, that was done a few years ago. Mm -hmm. Mostly, mostly because instinct. <laughs> yeah. But one of the one of the other altern alternate alternate um, because I'm I'm a big fan of alternate history. Yeah. And one of the other ones I did was a historical campaign that was based on the concept of. What if Franz Ferdinand survived his assassination attempt? That's kind of sick. We like and that. Th but the thing, the thing with any with any sort of alternate history approach is asking the "what if" is the first part of the question. The next part you have to answer is "what happens next." Yeah, of course, and, and that's where a lot of the fun comes in. For me, for me, the answer was because because I remember somebody saying, "Well, well, if he doesn't die, does that mean World War Two does?" Not World War Two. Does that mean World War One doesn't happen? No, it still happens. It just happens for. It just happens with a different set of circumstances. In because mm -hmm. the re the big reason that I ha that the idea propped up in my head was because of the fact that Franz, unlike his father, wanted to reform the Austro-Hungarian Empire. He wanted to re he wanted to reform the nations that build that built it up into a united states of austria hungary and give each of the states within it aside from just the germans and hungarians more more of a political voice mm -hmm. um as opposed to his father who wanted to maintain this tradition of the old of the old school monarchs and because because of that the idea it, the idea would be is that instead of instead of world war 1 playing out the way it does you have a Austria-Hungary civil civil war that just spills out because of the because of the way alliances worked back then. Because yeah. everybody no everybody has more or less agreed on the fact that World War One was inevitable because Europe was a powder keg at that time waiting to go off. Oh, absolutely. And I will I will admit one of the minor inspirations for doing that was um, Foundation, which was all about doing this statistical analysis to try and pre try and predict um, future events. Uh, 
I've never heard of that one before. That's pretty cool, actually. Found Foundation is was a series was a series by Isaac Asimov. Um, the original Foundation trilogy actually won a Hugo, which surprised surprised Asimov. He thought Lord of the Rings was going to get it, <laughs> but it is equal parts space opera and and political intrigue, and is more is spends a lot of time the about solving conundrums. It's probably the probably one of the more interesting of the worlds that Asimov had created that, at, compared to say Empire or Robots, which I know everybody brings up the th bring, brings up the three laws, but what a lot of people tend to forget is Asimov had this habit of introducing concepts like that and then showing the loopholes. Yeah. That was the major. That was the majority of the of the stories within the robot series. Oh, uh, uh, as someone who doesn't know his work nearly as well and mostly sees the sound bites, it, I mean, it's it's incredibly interesting and and classic kind of uh, fantasy sci fi approaches. But it, it's not it's not a level of depth I, I really was aware existed in in his work. Yeah, I, Asimov is 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 most certainly one of the one of the one of the, one of the big on, one of the big envelope pushers in the early days of of science fiction. Yeah, no doubt about that. Um, especially, I realize this is hard to believe, but there was a point in time when science fiction was utterly looked utterly looked down upon in the literary world. Absolutely. Um, that's the that's the reason why Sturgeon's Law was made because a lot of pe a lot of people were using these really bad um, pulp SF books to say that the whole genre was terrible, yeah. and Sturgeon replied with not with um, anything can be art, but ninety percent of all art is crap. The some people have said some people have used that to play cynicism, but the point he was trying to make was. Using using a few examples to say an entire genre is low quality is a, is a poor argument because you can do that with literally anything. Absolutely, there's no doubt about that. Uh, now, one thing that one thing that I am a bit a bit curious about within the within the sit within the system is I know you said that it's that it's built for a more episodic approach, but do you have a mechanism in place when it comes to ed when it comes to advancement? Yeah, so that was one of the hardest things to approach for this particular version of the game. Um, right now, uh, in the in this version of the rule set, advancement and progression is very limited. In the in the version of the game that I I, I played for years. Uh, we have we had an incredibly elaborate, uh, probably way too much so elaborate uh, advancement and progression system. Um, and I was I was counseled by a number of people as I was designing the the game for this edition that I should not touch it at all. And I was like, you know, I can kind of see where you're getting at with that because I've been I was told by a number of people that it was really daunting and was one of the things that kind of pushed them away from the game to some degree uh, earlier on. So what I've what I've kind of compromised with is for this intro version, um, I have kept progression to an absolute minimum. I have a stretch goal for my Kickstarter that if like if the Kickstarter goes well beyond what I what I thought and expected, I will try to put in at least some sort of more extensive progressions, uh, progression system in there. Mm -hmm. um, but my, my current plan is to use this as a way to get people interested and, and kind of hooked on the, on the system um, and get used to it, and then bring in all the fancy progression stuff in my next edition. Yeah. I mean, there, there's potential ways I can, I can see, improv I can see improvising um, te um, temp equipment, because... If you look at a lot of episodic stuff in t in in say t in say television there in um science fiction there is usually some sort of device or so or some sort of techno babble thing that's used once and never is used again. Absolutely, yeah. You in Enclave, whenever you go on a mission, there is no limitation on just grabbing stuff and using it in the mission setting. Mm -hmm. um, 
one of the one of the very fixed rules of the game is you can only leave the mission with stuff that you brought onto it. Uh, there is in-world justification for this, but it, it kind of helps keep characters consistent mission to mission. It makes it so that you can have missions involving very powerful, crazy artifacts without saying to yourself, oh god, who's going to try to steal it this time and completely derail my idea? Um, but one of the, the pieces of progression I do have in this version is one where you can you can get your character new pieces of customized gear. Um, that's something I really wanted to keep. I'm for whatever reason, I'm reminded of the nothing goes back rule when it comes to time traveling, tra travel in um, Terminator. Yeah, it's actually really similar to that because uh, in universe, the way that um, agents of the Enclave, this world-spanning mercenary organization, are deployed onto missions, is they're teleported there. Mm -hmm. uh, so you don't have to worry about like the whole. I've been told in D and D, there's like multi-day traveling sequences, and sometimes people don't know what to do with them. You don't have to worry about that in Enclave. You're just you're there, and you can be sent right into the action, so that uh, missions can be really, really action-packed with with minimal slow flagging parts, um, based on the designs of the conduit and the preferences of the players. Um, and then when the mission ends, you're teleported right back out. Uh, and so because of that. Enclave Teleporter says you can only teleport back stuff that you came on with. Like, so it's a, a cute little explanation that also I find serves a lot of like really useful like mechanical benefit for the way the game is structured and, and the way people can approach it. Um, there's two observations I have with that, and part, part of this is me wearing my influences on my sleeve, and part of this is me being the evil GM. Um, <laughs> I could easily see a Enclave HQ that is... Visually speaking, not far removed from, say, Sigil, the City of Doors in Planescape. Which I'm looking this up right now. It is meant. Sigil is meant to be this metropolis between between all the different dimensions in. Oh yeah. D, in okay. D &D's multiverse. I'm I'm looking at it now, and this could totally work. Oh, you know, because keep in mind the word metropolis is meant to translate to the mother city. Yeah. And. I could easily see an enclave HQ where you have people from all different type, all different types of technology levels, wor worlds, and and so on in this that are all eight that are all agents. But this is th this is the place where they go before they get deployed to different missions and the like. Oh the yeah. Other Wait, thing... here, let me send you a piece of art. I, I, just real quick, I I told my artist what enclave HQ looked like in my mind. He's like, God, how do I do this? Here's my best shot at it. Mm -hmm. Kind of a similar thing to what you're describing, like this this sleek, mysterious, almost blank slate that is populated by hundreds of like strange, colorful silhouettes of people from distant lands all over who are coming from all these different backgrounds and all kind of merging together as though it were frickin' normal because they're used to it because it's their job. Mm -hmm. The other Pardon thing, the interruption. <laughs> the other thing, and this is admittedly the uh, the. Um, evil GM part of me is when it comes to teleportation, I always pref I will always have a fondness for um, technology that is not entirely on the on the most stable side. Um, <laughs> and the idea being is that it, it the teleportation will get will get you to the area, but the specifics are a bit fuzzy. Mm -hmm. So. Best case scenario, you get you get to the exact coordinates that you're supposed to be. Um, worst case scenario, you get there, but th but there's some kind there's but something got screwed up. Like say, you end up teleporting there, and you're and you're in the air, you're like fifty feet in the air, or yeah. or you end you end up you end up be, you end up teleporting there, but it's the but um it's the it's the wrong time that you're supposed to be at. Or, yeah. Or, I I.e., you get teleported there, but it's like fifty years before you were before you were supposed to be there. Oh God! <laughs> yeah, I've I've played around with a little of that before. The way that I've always I've always hosted it is that the enclave is like to to be kind of like a, a stable anchor in the storytelling. The enclave itself is like almost omniscient, almost infallible, but you can play with that a lot, and you can say, "All right, the enclave is like." We have not had the time to scout out what you're doing here. This is a rush job. We get we just got this request. You need to go in there and you need to be ready for everything. 
Um, and so because of that, you're kind of like acknowledging and you're, getting, you're priming your players, all right, be ready for something weird. And then you can do things like teleport them 50 feet into the air. I, I've also done stuff where like I had people teleport into like locked suitcases at one point, And the first thing they had to do was try to get out of the suitcases. Mm-hmm. Like you, you can do all sorts of funky stuff with it, or, as well as the classic teleporting someone into the middle of a brawl. And just immediate combat. The second the mission starts, it's just combat. And that can be really fun as well. Yeah. And in that, in that same vein in that same vein, I'm a fan of giving players um very powerful equipment, but very unsafe equipment. Yeah. Unsafe for for everybody, both the pl- both the targets and the players, because on more than one occasion I've given a player the equivalent of the noisy cricket from Men in Black. <laughs> you know, a really power, a tiny, a tiny gun, really powerful, but also knocks you 50, 50 feet the other direction every time you fire it. Yeah. <laughs> or the, I will, I will admit that all of the weapons in the game, um, in the Alice games, are very good inspirations, like the demon dice, which. Sometimes they may help you, sometimes they may backfire on you. Yeah. Okay, you would probably like, on the Wanderer class, there is a, an optional item called a Nostrum. And the Nostrum is uh, a, an unmarked magical beverage that the Wanderer you know, picked up somewhere and is sure is going to be helpful someday. And the way that the Nostrum works is that the Nostrum is actually quite a powerful healing effect, but... Whoever, whoever takes the Nostrum has to pitch a downside that is proportionate to what they are trying to get healed. So if you have a nosebleed, you don't have to pitch a... Like, the downside is very, very minor. If you lost a leg, be ready to have some crazy shit happen, you know? Um, I think I'd, I, could eas- I could easily see somebody um, taking the Nostrum, re- regrowing, regrowing a leg... The problem, the problem is, it's it's <laughs> the problem is you have say somebody who is Caucasian, but now they have to explain why they why why they have a black leg, <laughs> as as oh, in yeah. as in it looks as in it looks like the leg of a black guy that's now that's now part of them. Yeah, where did you get that from? That on like whatever tentacles growing out of their face, hair on fire. You can do all sorts of stuff with this. And something I always try to tell people is like whenever. In Enclave, there is like a downside or a thing goes wrong. That's an opportunity right there. Mm-hmm. It's if nothing else, it's an opportunity for awesome character acting. Um, and something that Enclave really tries to do is when someone is demonstrating effort through things like and like commitment to the game through things like character acting, um, you reward that. You like try to you you give them um, more leeway in other regards. And so if something bad happens to your character, that's just an opportunity for you to show off, you know, and like. Give give some awesome justification for benefits that you're going to get down the line. Mm-hmm. And with that in, with that in mind, um, what would you be shooting for as far as a total page count? I know that stretch goals might expand that, but just in yep. the default. Right now, we have a set sixty page um, hard copy page count. Um, the PDF is probably going to be, you know, 58, something like that. Um, I, I have, from the document I sent you, you you can see that I have all wording, all graphic design final. I have the majority of the art final. Um, I have like nine more pieces that I'm waiting on and then we are done, barring stretch goals. Um, and I think that if, for the stretch goals, I have up to four more classes being added and then the progression system. I th- for each class, plus two pages uh, for the progression system, call that plus, I'm going to guess, like four or five, something like that. Uh, and so in total, I think the, the book is 0% chance it's over 75 pages. Mm-hmm. Trying to keep it short, quick, accessible. Yeah. Um, and I tried to make it such that if you're like a brand new person being just like dragged into the game, you can read like the first six pages plus your class, and you you know enough to to be able to participate. Mm-hmm. And I, I will certainly be looking forward to that. But 
<laughs> with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. My pleasure. It has been a delight. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Very kind of you, Mildred. And of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!